So we're talking about thousands of people on a daily basis crossing from Ireland to the US. Fairly primitive conditions, even under the best of circumstances, those crossings were dangerous. You were going across 3,000 miles of ocean, uh, sometimes in the dead of winter with no predictions of weather, etc., in rickety ships. What were the circumstances of those crossings? Circumstances were bleak. We're not talking about passenger liners. We're mainly talking about commercial vessels that have been retrofitted to accommodate passengers. The passengers have to provide their own food, their own clothing. They're not being given comfortable berths with their staterooms, with portholes looking out on the ocean. They are mainly in the hold of the ship. Darkness, the rocking of the vessel, very little fresh air, very little ventilation. The term coffin ships comes from the fact that so many will die on the crossing or become ill on the crossing. Remember, we're leaving a country where there's a famine, so we're not in the best of health when we leave. And then we're experiencing this voyage where we have very poor provisions, very little access to fresh water. And so if you already are carrying something or if someone else on this vessel is carrying something, the conditions are so crowded that disease will spread. So we have a quarantine station in Boston Harbor. Rainsford Island becomes a hospital station where the ship will have to stop and everyone will have to wait and if there is an illness. Or you might be turned back if you were too ill to enter. Rainsford Island, is it still called Rainsford Island? It still Island? is Rainsford Island, yes. And there's also a hospital on Long Island. And throughout the Harbor Island, there are grave sites for, there would, would have been a hospital or a quarantine station set up on Rainsford Island or on Long Island and beside it often unmarked graves of those who did not survive. They may, might have made it here, but then awaiting the end of quarantine. So tragic, heartbreaking stories about those who don't make it, and also difficult stories for those who do. And that's the piece of the story to remember, is that those who do survive will come to transform the city of Boston over the next generation. What were the conditions when somebody did make it in? Describe what they would have seen in the city, how they would have met, how they would have assimilated. Well, the first thing you're going to see will be the waterfront. And the two main points of disembarkation would be what then was the south end of Boston, the area around what was called Fort Hill, today the financial district, or in East Boston. East Boston becomes the exit point for the Cunard Line, the docks in East Boston at the immigration station. And so you're on the docks. You had left the docks in Liverpool, and now you're on the docks here in Boston, and you have to find a place to work, a place to live. And the areas around the docks become teeming slums. The Fort Hill area had been built as a, a Yankee neighborhood back in the late 18th, early 19th century, but with the opening up of the Back Bay, the South End, later on, that clientele moves out and they rent their houses for the most part. Now we see more cheap houses being built on the back lots and other places. So you are looking for a place to sleep, a place to live. So the Fort Hill area becomes a bustling, teeming slum. You're also looking for a place to work, and the docks will be the most likely source of employment. You might also work in, if you can get up to Lowell, you could work in one of the factories there. There also are other small manufactories around the area. South Boston has an iron work. South Boston has other industrial enterprises that are within walking distance. But what you would see is primarily wooden buildings or brick buildings, crowded streets filled with people, many of them like you, young Irish men or Irish woman who's looking for a place to live, a place to work, you're fortunate to know the language, although you speak with an accent and you may also speak Gaelic, but you still don't have a problem with a language barrier, but you are looking for a place where you would be able to survive. Not an apartment, you're going to be looking for a bed or a room to share with someone else. So in spite of the fact that these were bleak conditions, you talk about them as being slums and teeming and Poverous, I'm sure, in many, many different ways. And yet, in comparison with what they left, Boston must have seemed a bright light indeed in their lives. You're leaving a place where people are starving, where there is no food. The one crop you have been growing is gone. 
and you're coming to a place, another thing we have on the docks, the waterfront of Boston, are all the marketplaces where you see all the produce that is coming into Boston or going out of Boston. You also have the opportunity for employment, not just raising grain for the British trade, but in factories, in the ironworks, and the docks. Also, you'll have, if you, when you marry and have children, or if you've brought children with you, free education for your children. You will also have the ability to vote if you're a man over the age of 21. In Ireland, the Irish could not vote, but here you can. You could join the police force here after the early 1850s. You can become a part of this society. So already by the 1850s and 1860s, you will see some Irish people who, like you, had emigrated here and now have become successful. Someone like Thomas Cass, who is elected to the Boston School Committee in 1860. So you do have opportunities here you would not have had in Ireland. So you're seeing the origins, the seeds really, of a community that starts to assimilate to America and indeed starts to take steps to become the Irish of America yes. today and the Boston yes. Irish of and today. And another important thing you would see too are Catholic churches. Your religion can be practiced openly here which it could not be in Ireland. And we talk often about the burning of the Ursuline convent and the virulent anti-Catholicism here. But the fact is, you can practice your religion here. And your bishop and your priests are members of the Genteel Society of Boston. So religion and uh, country, national origin, ethnicity become inextricably linked. How did the Irish coming to Boston handle the national tragedy at home? How did they process what had happened to them, their society? Uh, did they see it as a single incident? Were they bitter? Or did they want to forget? What was the atmosphere from your readings of that period? Probably the biggest impact this is going to have on the Irish who come to Boston is a deep bitterness toward England. The Irish in Boston and Irish in other American cities are able to assimilate and become part of American society. And by the early 20th century, that is about 60, 70 years after their arrival, are dominating Boston politics. And Boston still being a very important American city, this is, of course, something that the national political leaders will be cognizant of. And it's one reason the United States is going to be slow to enter the First World War. Why are we going to go to war to support the British Empire? You see the anti-English attitude or anti-English sentiment being transmitted through generations as the cause of this. 